So good morning, everyone. So um, today we'll be talking. Um, I'll try to condense as much as I can. You know, this pulmonary hypertension itself can be like a day-long seminar. So we'll try to uh, go over as much as we can in the uh, next 20 minutes. So what I'll be uh, going over is some of the recent developments in terms of uh, classification and uh, newer um, disease, uh, you know, treatment options uh, which are available in pulmonary hypertension. So my disclosure, I'm speak on the Speaker Bureau for Actelian and Bayer. So um, this came out of the Fifth World Symposium for Pulmonary Hypertension, where the definition of pulmonary hypertension um, is you know, defined as mean pulmonary artery pressure over 25. And pulmonary arterial hypertension, so I want you to recognize uh, this uh, distinction where pulmonary hypertension essentially includes all comers who have mean pulmonary artery pressure over 25. And pulmonary arterial hypertension are those whose pulmonary uh, artery occlusion pressure, or commonly known as wedge pressure, is under 15, with a PVR, which is uh, calculated as you know <clears throat> mean uh, pulmonary artery pressure minus the uh, wedge pressure divided by cardiac output, greater than three woods units. So all of these measurements are really you know, measured by right heart catheterization, which is why I strongly feel that the cardiologists ha have a really big role in you know, taking care of these patients. Um, can you advance slide, please? So going over uh, the clinical classification, which was again updated in 2013, uh, you know, group one is PAH, which is idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, drug and toxin induced, and you know, uh, connective tissue disease. This is what was earlier known as primary pulmonary hypertension. Now the only uh, things which were changed in 2013 were some of the um, uh, diseases which were a part of PAH were moved under group five and PVOD was separately classified. Uh, and uh, group four is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. The reason I want you to look at these two groups are these two groups are where we actually have approved therapies uh, which are disease specific and have been shown to make uh, an improvement in you know, survival and quality of life in these patients. However, the most common cause for pulmonary hypertension, over 60% of patients who have pulmonary hypertension actually have due to left heart disease. And these are the patients who do not have PAH. These are patients who have wedge pressure greater than 15, along with mean pulmonary, uh, mean pulmonary arterial pressure of over 25. So uh, this gives you uh, uh, an uh, overview of what happens in the natural history of pulmonary hypertension. And as you can see here, uh, you know, as the uh, disease progresses, you know, your pulmonary uh, artery pressure kind of goes down, but your right atrial pressure increases, suggesting the patient's having worsening RV dysfunction, the cardiac output goes down. So in essence, you know, uh, uh, honestly, pulmonary um, hypertension uh, when it really is being treated, it's more of a disease of the right ventricle, and that's what really ties into prognosis. So when do you want to consider uh, pulmonary hypertension in a differential diagnosis? You know, traditionally, PAH has been thought of as a young woman's disease, and in the last 10 years, the epidemiology is really changing. You know, we are seeing this in more older people and oftentimes these patients have other comorbidities. You know, they, they might have essential hypertension, they have diabetes, you know, but they also have other uh, diseases associated with PH, like connective tissue disease or HIV. Uh, so you still have to consider PH in differential diagnosis when somebody comes to you with exertional dyspnea, you know, syncope or angina. It's really hard when patients present to you with exertional angina because a lot of these patients have other uh, comorbidities which could explain the exertional dyspnea, but when you feel that your exertional dyspnea is out of proportion to, uh, you know, their um, uh, coexisting disease, that's when you have to really uh, think about pulmonary hypertension. 
Now, the screening test really is uh, echocardiogram. And um, as you know, most of you know, you know, you go off of the uh, tricuspid regurgitation jet and measure the systolic PA pressure. Uh, and if the systolic PA pressure is over 35 or 40, that should uh, you know, raise um, suspicion for pulmonary hypertension. Now, a caveat here is that uh, echo you know, has both false positives and false negatives when it comes to you know, diagnosing pulmonary hypertension, so it has to be taken in context with other things such as you know, RV function, you know, right atrial size, as you can see here, the right atrial size is much bigger than the left atrial size. Um, uh, and a uh, few other things which come from, you know, history, uh, such as, you know, family history, uh, presence of other comorbidities, you know, connective tissue disease, systemic sclerosis, HIV, liver disease, portal hypertension, congenital heart disease, all of this go uh, much in favor of PAH versus uh, other things such as uh, atrial fibrillation, obesity, all these things lead to uh, left-sided heart disease uh, or have PEF leading to uh, secondary pulmonary hypertension or WHO group 2 pulmonary hypertension. So again, I want to reiterate this uh, over and over again that echo-derived reports of PH are not considered diagnostic. So if you have a patient who has uh, unexplained dyspnea or somebody in whom you consider that the dyspnea is out of proportion to their underlying disease, these are patients you should consider a right heart catheterization. Again, you know, since the diagnosis is made based on mean PA pressure, which you cannot get on an echocardiogram, you really need a right heart cath before you start treatment. I think, you know, the main reason really is that, you know, as physicians, one of the things we do not want to do is cause harm. And in certain patients with who group 2 pulmonary hypertension or the patients with left heart disease, starting pH-specific therapy really can cause them to worsen, and that's really something that you do not want to do. So uh, uh, any of these patients that you're suspecting pH should get a right heart catheterization before starting therapy. So uh, this is an algorithm you know, in terms of uh, what are the things that you need to do to make a diagnosis of uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, which again, you know, mainly it, it leads into ruling out other conditions uh, such as you know, having chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension with the VQ scan, you know, uh, other coexisting conditions which could strengthen your um, suspicion of PAH. Um, and uh, again, uh, doing a sleep study for uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Now switching gears here, we'll just talk a little bit about you know, pulmonary arterial hypertension therapies and what have uh, come in the last three, four years. Uh, so th these are cer certain general treatment measures because a lot of these patients have coexisting uh, right-sided heart failure. The, the, you know, they need to be on diuretics. In terms of oral anticoagulation, uh, the jury is out there. The current guidelines are to put patients who have idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension on warfarin, but in other groups of PAH, it's very controversial. The thought process really here is that you know, these patients who are on IV therapies and have idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, one, they are at high risk of catheter-associated PEs, and they also will tolerate PEs much poorly. So these are patients in whom you should consider putting them on warfarin. But uh, everybody else, uh, I think, uh, really, the guideline doesn't recommend for you to put them on uh, oral anticoagulation. Um, again, oxygen, uh, depending on uh, their oxygen saturation. And digoxin, uh, again, uh, there is, the data is uh, very um, uh, thin there. Uh, now, in terms of disease-specific therapies, there are really three pathways uh, that we target to uh, decrease pulmonary uh, vascular resistance and, in turn, improve uh, RV function. So this is the endothelin pathway, the nitric oxide pathway, and the prostacycline pathway. And, uh, you know, there are multiple medications which are which target these pathways. And the, sort of the newer kids on the block in the last uh, five years have been 
Massive 10 ton in the ERA category. Uh, and in the prostacycline category, you know, there is an oral pro, you know, prostacycline tripostinal, but also there's a prostacycline receptor agonist, selexipag, and uh, there is a newer class of medication, which is a soluble guanylate cyclic stimulator, which acts on the nitric oxide pathway, and the drug there is riosiquat. So uh, th these few medications have come out in the last, uh, you know, uh, three, four years, and from being an orphan disease, which just had one medication, now we have a choice of about 13 medications to choose from for, uh, for this disease. So uh, just going over a specific features of a few pH therapies, you know, PDE5 inhibitors, again, fairly well tolerated. You, most of you are familiar with sildenafil and tadalafil. Uh, again, you know, it's fairly beneficial in early stages of disease, but as the disease progresses, the efficacy seems to wane off. Uh, and again, using increasing doses can be limited by side effects. And in a certain populations, some patients can get ophthal uh, ophthalmologic issues, such as, you know, uh, the, these... Uh, uh, phosphines and, and such. Um, and uh, in terms of the ERAs, uh, they're very, very effective in early form of pH. And uh, again, they act not only to vasodilate, but also help in anti-proliferation of, uh, um, of cells in the pulmonary vasculature. And uh, again, they're not effective in functional class four and in over heart right heart failure patients. So both uh, uh, PD-5 inhibitors and ERAs are really effective in somebody who is class three. And, uh, and you know, prostanides are really reserved for those patients who have class four. Now, as far as pH is concerned, when you're looking at uh, functional class, we use uh, WHO functional class. The only difference between WHO functional class and uh, NYHA functional class is the inclusion of syncope. So if you have syncope, uh, you know, then you're class four, along with, you know, shortness of breath at rest. And pre-syncope um, is a functional class three uh, there. Uh, so again, you know, the, the prostanides are, uh, we have the most experience because this was the first medication which was approved and has been in uh, use for almost uh, 20 years now. And, uh, uh, you know, they're used uh, really for rescue therapy in patients who are admitted with uh, flooded right heart failure and, uh, uh, yeah, and shock. And uh, the, the big thing is that, you know, there are risks with intravenous uh, delivery. Now, there are subcutaneous and inhaled options, um, but, you know, all of them come with uh, their own caveats. But this is very, very effective therapy. And they do have a lot of side effects, which include jaw pain, flushing, nausea, headache, and bone pain. So the, 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 really the irony in pH is that, you know, the most effective treatment is used as last resort. And this is where, you know, the newer medication, which was Selexipag, may come in in the future where, you know, it was a very effective oral therapy. And uh, some of the data coming out with oral oranitram also sort of supports that there may be you know, uh, mortality benefit for both of these oral therapies to be used early on. And there is a trial right now going on for upfront triple therapy. So again, this, uh, this is a newer class of medications which is approved. And like I said earlier, it works on the nitric oxide pathway. The, the good thing about this is that it's nitric oxide independent. So you can actually use this uh, later in the disease and it's much more potent than PDE5 inhibitors. But again, uh, since they're more potent, they also have more systemic hypotensive effects compared to um, sildenafil. Now, one of the things which was all, always plagued PAH has been all their you know, therapies were approved based on a 12-week trial of medications showing improvement in functional class. Because PH was sort of, you know, was regarded or still regarded as an orphan disease, you know, the drugs would get uh, approved just based on improvement in functional class or six-minute walk distance. However, in the last three years, they've you know, we've switched gears, and there have been uh, at least two studies which have actually looked at meaningful uh, clinical endpoints, and which really is defined as you know a survival. Um, and or clinical worsening as uh, an uh, endpoint. And uh, uh, here again, um, you know, this, this shows one of the trials with uh, Selexipag, which again showed uh, 
uh, time to uh, first event. Um, and uh, this was the ambition trial, which again, I think changed the paradigm a little bit in PAH, where upfront dual therapy was found to be you know, beneficial uh, in reducing uh, mortality and morbidity in these patients. And as you can see here, upfront uh, a combination therapy of tadalafil and, uh, and ambrisentan uh, showed that you know, at the end of three years, your um, survival um, free of morbidity was 67% uh, uh, versus 56% in uh, monotherapy arm. So I think, you know, the latest guidelines really recommend for us to consider uh, starting patients on dual therapy where you can target two, um, uh, two pathways simultaneously to decrease morbidity in these patients. Uh, again, this sort of uh, suggests, you know, uh, kind of helps us um, differentiate which patients are at higher risk and intermediate risk or low risk of decompensation in the next one year. And as you can see, a lot of these measures are measures of uh, right-sided heart failure um, and uh, anti-pro BNP, uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test, six-minute walk, all of these uh, are really reflective of your RV function. I just want to quickly talk uh, for two minutes about CTEF. The reason I wanted to talk about this is this is a curative form of pH, and more and more we are recognizing that this is out there that we are not, uh, you know, just not paying attention to. And the reason it's really important is because it's potentially curable with a thromboendarterectomy. And, uh, you know, uh, even though, um, uh, you know, most of the patients who get PEs eventually completely get better and don't have any residual thromboembolic disease, up to 5% of the patients could have chronic PEs leading to pulmonary uh, hypertension. Uh, and the, the diagnostic screening test here is VQ scan. And uh, I know we all get a lot of CT, PA, uh, you know, P protocols, but CTs are good for, you know, ruling out acute disease. They're not really good at ruling out a chronic disease. As you can see here, you know, VQ is really good at picking up hypoperfused hypo areas. And uh, the sensitivity is really, really good. Uh, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to picking up uh, uh, CTAF. And uh, this is another patient who had, uh, you know, bad RV failure uh, from um, uh, CTPH. And, you know, after uh, he underwent surgery and all this clot was pulled off, you know, the PA pressures came down from 80 to 40. And, you know, a patient now is off all therapies and functional class one. Uh, so I uh, wanted to make a plug in here for our CTEF program that uh, we are starting here. We are actively screening for patients and our surgeons have been to San Diego, which has been the world's leading center in, in uh, pulmonary endarterectomy and have gotten trained. And we also are uh, starting a balloon pulmonary angioplasty program for inoperable patients who have distal disease. So if you have patients who have PH, uh, uh, please consider, you know, uh, getting a VQ scan in them and actively screening for CTEF. And uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, I have my email address and my phone number, and happy to talk after. Thank you very much.